Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Live Ultralight podcast powered by Outdoor Vitals. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Michael McKnight, also known as the Low Carb Runner, um, to discuss specifically uh, diet in big efforts. So Michael is extremely well known for his running. He's, he's extremely accomplished as an ultra runner and coach. Um, some of his achievements include placing first place at the Coca Dona 250, the Moab 240, not once, but twice, uh, Bigfoot, not once, Bigfoot 200, not once, but twice. Um, he also run has, rin, <laughs> has run um, the Moab, 240, the Bigfoot 200, and the Tahoe 200 in a single year, not once, but twice. So he's really the king, I guess, of 200s. I think that's also what he might be be known as. Um, but just an incredible athlete, especially for distance. And he's really built all of this, um, this, this record, all of, he's broken all these records, including course records, utilizing this specific nutrition plan or diet. So today we talk about that. It's a low carb approach, um, not quite keto, but all of you guys and gals out there that love to eat keto, this is going to really help you for as far as looking at things um, to maybe do on the trail that could help you to stay more in a fat burning mode. Um, Michael doesn't necessarily call himself a, a keto runner or a no carb uh, runner, but more of a low carb and very strategic. So there's a lot to be learned from this. I know I learned a ton from this and it definitely inspired me to look at this, even from a longevity standpoint of swelling, inflammation, recovery, um, just a lot of, of fantastic information in here and a few um, tidbits of, of information that, that, uh, I found quite comical. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I'll go ahead and roll this right now. And I hope you guys enjoy this conversation with the low carb runner or in other words, Michael McKnight. All right, Michael McKnight, super excited to have you on the podcast today. I wanted to start off with a question about what your morning looks like. Like what have you eaten so far and what have you been doing so far? <laughs> uh, so every day is a little bit different. Um, but today, well, so basically me and my wife, um, it just started su it's summer here, um, as it is everywhere, I guess. <laughs> um, but we, we started something where I live in Cache Valley called Run Club. And basically Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 9, um, kids ages, you know, I think our youngest is three-year-old, um, who's my daughter, actually, from three-year-old to all the way up to 18 years old, um, come and run for 30 minutes and just see how far they can run throughout the whole summer. And then me and my wife just kind of sit there and they have bracelets and we can scan their QR codes and it keeps track of their mileage for the whole summer. <clears throat> and so with that little like 30 minute commitment every day, like I've had to shift my routine just a little bit. And mm -hmm. so, um, I am getting up at about five 30. Um, so I got up at five 30 today and I did a hour and a half run in the mountains soon as I got back, um, I typically like to get most of my nutrition from like real food. Um, historically that's been like eggs and beef liver, um, almost every morning after my run. Uh, but today, since I was on the go and I still want to prioritize getting some food, um, I essentially made like a, a like a little bit of a smoothie concoction. Um, I poured in some raw milk, um, some whey protein, some collagen, and then just a little bit of blueberries um, to get a little bit of carbohydrate in there. And then um, took that with me to run club. And um, that's how I got my, my fuel for post run. So that's all I've had today so far. <laughs> yeah. But it's a little bit uh, different just because of how busy we are. <laughs> yeah. And from, from some of the conversations I've heard, it's, this is kind of, and we, I guess we can just dive right into this, but like you, you, you do eat carbohydrates and, and your tag or kind of what you're known for is the low carb runner, not the no carb runner. Right. So mm -hmm. like, um, you do work those in super strategically. And one of the questions I see a lot of times and have experienced with people that have come on the trail with me has been kind of this concept of like, they're so fearful of coming out of like ketosis and, and, and whatnot that they're like, even on trail where they're doing big, like significantly more effort that day and burning significantly more calories. It's kind of like the plague still to, to touch much in a carbohydrate. So I'm curious what your thought is on, on just that facet there. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> So yeah, you're right. I'm the low carb runner, not the no carb runner, like not even the keto runner. Like, you know, I yeah. post a lot to my Instagram stories about the carbohydrates that I utilize and I still get people who are like, that's not keto. 
And I just reply like, well, yeah, like I'm not keto, like I'm I'm strategic keto, but I'm not full-time keto. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, but yeah, I I get it. Like when I first started, I was like, I I say carb phobic, Um, (laughs) like people who do a low carb approach. I do think it's easy to get fearful of carbohydrates. Um, You know, if somebody's like eating this way to like lose weight slash maintain rate, then I, sorry, maintain weight. Um, I'm not going to pass any judgment there, but I do feel like if people want to get the most out of their nutrition, then they're essentially just like kind of doing their bodies a disservice by completely eliminating carbohydrates. Um, my goal with everything is just to be just low enough that, you know, for example, you know, I went for my run first thing this morning at you know, 5.30 in the morning. And that was after not eating all night. Like I don't eat before I go for my run. And so I found that like anywhere from 100 to 150 grams of carbohydrates, at least with my body a day, um, when you factor in that short little fast from sleeping and then going into running the next morning, every day I'm always going into some low grade level of ketosis. Um, so every day my body is familiar with that but I don't believe you need to be in it full time to be efficient at it. And so my goal is just to be able essentially like if you can utilize glucose and fat, then I don't know why you would choose to not do that because they're both going to have benefits basically. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like from what I understand, you're kind of eating maybe around 20% of your calories come from carbohydrates, that kind of a rule of thumb or, and then you're, you're, you're cycle them up a little bit and down from, um, I think that's, I think that's really key. Why, why would you still eat a carbohydrate? Cause with any cult like following, which like, uh, the ketogenic diet has and, and, you know, <laughs> like I have family members that have done it and, and it's so funny cause they'll do it. They'll lose weight. They'll, you know, they'll kind of go through that cycle and then they'll come off of it. And it's like this big swing to the other side again. And, and so I always, you know, I'm always trying to find the good, in things, because obviously it's something about it is working for people, right? But <clears throat> why, like you said, you're doing your body a disservice if you're not eating carbs. I, I think that was what you just said. But like, obviously you, you you believe that some carbs are necessary. So why, what do those carbs do when you do consume them for you? Yeah, so I'd say two things. Um, the first thing, and you just kind of touched it, like people who follow strict keto diets, carnivore diets, it's very it's not common for somebody to be a hundred percent true to it. It's very common for people to like maybe binge on the weekend or just like, like you said, come in and out of it and just almost swing completely to the other side. In my opinion, like a hundred percent of my carbohydrates are coming from um, raw milk. Like there are sugars in milk. So you're getting carbohydrate there Um, fruit and then raw honey. And so a hundred percent of my carbohydrates come from that. And I found that especially with the fruit and the honey, like it's very sweet. And I do believe that the majority of people's metabolic issues comes from eating foods with added sugar. Um, Once you rid yourself of that, I don't think that eating fruit and honey is going to mess up your metabolic health. At least I've seen that with myself. I've used uh, continuous glucose monitors often. Um, just to make sure. And like after eating a big bowl of fruit and honey, like I hardly see any spike with my glucose. And so I do believe added sugar is the culprit. And so simply eating a little bit of fruit every day, I I found at least for me, like it's taken away my cravings for like the ice cream and the candy and the cookies and all that stuff. People tend to eat when they're too strict. And so I do believe the flexibility is good because it helps you stick with it. And then um, two, from a performance standpoint, I always just like relate it to like a car that's either equipped with NOS or not equipped with NOS. Um, <laughs> and like, I'm sure people All know what NOS is. Fast and Furious lovers yeah. out there. <laughs> fast and Furious right there. It's like, you know, you have a generic car and yes, like, you know, when you look at what a car can do, like a Dodge Charger or whatever, like it has some speed, it has some pickup. And so I always say like, that's like the huge reserve of fat that all of our bodies have. Like you can do great things off of your fat, but once you add in carbohydrates, it's essentially adding in a canister of NOS and like no one can debate. Like once you hit that button, your car is going to go a lot faster for a short amount of time. And so I believe that that's what carbohydrates are. It's like, you have your baseline of fat burning, you intake some strategic carbohydrates that helps you hike faster or run faster or whatever for a short period of time. And then since you're 
dipping in and out of ketosis daily, your body's not going to have a hard time just going right back into like that steady state of, of fat burning. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And do you, have you noticed that by, by doing that, that your body adapts to burning fat like quicker? Like, is that, is that, do you feel like there's a huge learned behavior of your body to be able to switch to burning fat? Cause like all of our bodies have the ability to burn fat. Right. But it sounds like you, you kind of look at it almost like a muscle that can be trained. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just like with any muscles, like, well, maybe that's a bad example, <laughs> but like when I did start, I did a strict keto diet for probably like six to eight months. Um, I do think it's important, like, especially if you've like had a high carbohydrate diet your whole life. Like, you know, for me, I ate a lot of pasta. I ate a lot of takeout food. I had like a bowl of ice cream every day, Mountain Dew every day. And so I was like hardly ever tapping into my fat storage. And so for me, like, yeah, my body wasn't used to it. And so I had like a longer adaption period than a lot of people. Uh, but after that six to eight months and my body like got super familiar with burning fat consistently, um, that's when I started adding in more strategic carbohydrates and you know, for me, I don't test my ketones because I feel like if you get too caught up in that, that it can cause a lot of like worry. <laughs> um, people yeah. get too over analytical on those ketones. And so for me, like the only marker that I use to measure my ability to burn fat right now is just how um, I'm able to sustain a fast. And so I do implement strategic intermittent fasting where I'll fast 18 to 24 hours, sometimes a couple times a week. Um, and I believe that if I can do that without having like severe hunger pains, then that's still a pretty good indicator that my body knows how to burn fat for fuel. Because if you don't, you're going to have like the brain fog, you're going to feel weak and tired. Like it's yeah. hard to fast if you're not a fat adapted person. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're fasting more than once a week. Yeah. I mean, like I take Sundays off from running. And so like, I'm usually doing at least an 18 hour fast on those days. Um, and then I do have at least another day during the week where I do lighter mileage, slower mileage, and I'll do like a 16 or an 18 hour fast on that day. Yeah, man, that's, it's pretty wild. I mean, it sounds like you've worked your way into that so that it is sustainable for you coming from maybe another perspective. It's like, man, that's crazy. That's a lot. Like I actually tried to fast once a, once a week at the first part of this year and, you know, <clears throat> me and you can relate. I was also a very big kid. Like I grew up <laughs> overweight. I like all through school, like my goal was to be able to run a mile without having to stop. Like they'd ever, they'd always make you run a mile in gym, like once yeah. a semester, you know? And I mean, it, it was very difficult for me to do without just getting like side, side ache and have to stop. And I just, I mean, I was the opposite of a runner. Right. And so I, I kind of share that with, with your background and origin story as well. Um, and now, now I've lost my train of thought here, but, but like, <laughs> I, I guess what, 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 what I, I have a relationship with food that can be challenging where it's like, man, I can, I can binge. Right. And I can eat. And so I think that idea of kind of probably working your way into stuff is to be a little bit more sustainable. Cause I, again, I, I was struggling cause when I did the fast once a week, I'd come off of that really hungry. And then I would typically throughout the week, I'd kind of make up for it in probably a bit of a scarcity mindset of eating, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so maybe what I was doing wrong is I wasn't just, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, doing a more like with those fasts, doing a little bit more of a fat, you know, fat proteins approach. You think that could have been part of it? Um, if you weren't doing that, then I do think that was a part of it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, okay. You, you get more satiated off of fat and protein versus carbohydrates. And so if that's like the majority of what your diet is and you know, your body's going to have more fuel to burn essentially when you have to do those fasts. Yeah. Um, the guy who edits this podcast would, would kill me if I didn't ask this. He struggles with like when he starts running and he starts increasing his miles, he gets really hungry and he starts gaining weight is how he puts it. Like he starts, <laughs> starts eating, like, you know, cause it doesn't make sense, right? He's burning more calories, but somehow he gains weight and he gets really frustrated with that. Um, what, like, have you ever seen that before? Or do you have any thoughts on, and he's done things he's done like zero carbs before, 
Um, you know, he's kind of cycled on and off a few diets similar to that, but right now he's eating like a common standard, standard diet, you know, and he's just finding that he's, he's getting really hungry. And, and, um, obviously then it's, it's correlating to him gaining a few pounds, even though he's running more miles than he ever has. So like the times that he's done zero carb, does he still have issues with gaining weight even when he ramps up his mileage? Um, I think the problem is when he starts ramping up his mileage, he, he starts to feel too low energy. So that's been part of when he's switched, but I think, you know, if I'm reading between the lines, it might be possibly that he's still doing like full ketosis instead of like, we kind of, we, we teased him a lot cause he'd, he'd come on our trips and like an overnight trip and he'd bring like a big old salami. Like that was, that was the only thing he brought to eat. Right. Like maybe some nuts <laughs> and a salami and like zero carbs, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So maybe so, reading between the lines, maybe that's the issue is that he's, he's, you know, it's all or nothing with the carbs. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say without knowing exactly what he's doing every day, but I mean, if he's doing a standard American diet, that makes sense to me because I mean, it's ultra processed, like your body is going to like burn through that. You're going to have a huge glucose spike and crash and then just like keep eating because it's only a couple hours after eating a high carb meal that you're going to want to start eating a lot again. So I would guess that he's just getting in too many calories from just having so many crashes and then you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the higher carb you eat, the more you're going to eat throughout the day because you have stronger hunger cues versus somebody who's fat adapted. Like, I mean, essentially it turns into an issue where you're not getting enough calories because you're just always full because you're just always burning fat. And so I would guess that he's either just eating too much from like burning carbohydrates too fast. Um, that, or like when he's doing the zero carb approach, I mean, cause it is possible to gain weight if you're not getting enough calories because your body's going to start storing that um, as fat because you're not eating enough. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a hard balance to figure out. Like you can't eat too much. You can't eat too little. Like, but I would yeah. guess he's either eating too many carbs and he's just continually eating or he's not getting enough calories and his body's storing the food as fat um, versus burning it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like it can be, a bit of a fine line. And so I, recently you won the Coca Dona 250. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's, that's, that's a way cool achievement. And I mean, and obviously you're, you're so well um, achieved in, in these long runs. I'm curious for something like the Coca Dona 250, how do you balance what you eat and what, what is it that you're eating out there, right? Like, do you go, significantly more carbs and in, in efforts like that, or do you stick to like the 30%, you know, 20 to 30% rule? Just really interested kind of what that looks like when it's obviously that's a, that's a very long effort, right? Um, is that like around 60 hours or longer? Um, the Coca Dona took me 69 hours. So almost three yeah. days, almost 70 yeah. hours. So yeah, well, I'd love to hear kind of how, how that balance works with, with diet in a, in an effort like that. Yeah. So I believe that the longer the distance, the more you can get away with doing less carbohydrates just because like you're going at such a lower effort. I mean, scientifically, the higher your heart rate is, the more glucose you're going to need because the more glucose you're burning. Um, Whereas the lower your heart rate, like even if you're not following a low carb diet, like that lower heart rate is going to send you into some level of fat burning. And so I, I don't do as many carbohydrates for these longer multi-day efforts, <clears throat> but that being said, I do get the majority of my carbohydrates on that first day because I do like, at least in my own experience and from the like experience, a lot of the people I coach have had, um, that first day, your stomach, is, it, it can struggle trying to get used to like everything that's going on. Like, you know, exerting yourself. And then on top of that, trying to digest food every hour. And so I found that for me, that if I just do simple carbohydrates for the first like 12 to 16 hours in the form of gels, in the form of fruits, um, it helps my stomach adapt to what's going on. And then after that 12 to 16 hours, I'll, I'll start doing more fats, more proteins, more real food. Um, you know, I'll have bunless burgers, 
Um, I've had my wife pick me up a steak in the middle of a race before. Um, I've done chicken wings before. So like, as the race goes on, I do a lot more real food. Um, a lot of times I'll bring my own food just because, um, like I'm trying to do everything I can to help me get to the finish line as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And like at a lot of these races, when they're cooking food on the grill or whatever, they're using seed oils, which I don't touch because of the inflammatory response. And so I'll bring my own food or I'll bring like butter and have my crew tell the aid station to cook my food in butter and not in any other kind of oil. Um, but yeah, at Cocodona, I did a lot of raw milk um, just because I was having stomach issues in the form of real food. Um, anytime like a, an actual piece of food touched my tongue, I'd start gagging and I'd have a hard time swallowing it, which has happened to me before sometimes at a race. And at that point I have to switch to liquid calories. And, um, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I'm used to drinking raw milk and drinking a lot of raw milk. So I had no issues just like, you know, I'd come into aid stations, I'd chug a bunch of milk and then take off kind of a thing. So Holy cow. yeah, fats and proteins are what I end up shifting my focus to after about 16 hours of running in these, these races. Yeah. I mean, do you think on that day one too, like you're, you're the most fresh, so you're probably going the fastest as well. You're probably burning a little bit more carbohydrates that day anyways. Cause you're, you're maybe, I don't know, just, just a thought there. Um, I imagine it's, it's hard to hold back on, you know, you know, it's a long race, right. But it's still like gotta be hard to hold back. Cause you got guys that are just going to take off. Right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. But I mean, when I first started, like I would get caught up in the hype and go out too hard and then blow up and have to walk a lot. But you know, Coca Dona ended up being, I think it was my 10th 200. Um, wow. Wow. And so I, 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 I'm, I'm used to people taking off too fast and I'm comfortable just kind of hanging back and knowing that if I hold back, I'll be able to make up a lot more time on day two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you've, you've got an incredible track record of these, these big long distance, uh, races, right. And I, I mean, do you still hold, I, I think you held the, even the course record and like the Moab 240, right? Um, Yeah in a weird way. Um, so that year they had to reroute the course for snow. Uh, and so uh, I did get the course record, but that was for the snow route. Um, okay. I do believe that I still have like the overall like record for fastest time that anybody's ran the Moab 240, but that's not on the original course. So there are two course records right now for that race. Gotcha. Still just an absolutely incredible record for these, these long distance efforts. And one of the questions I think that, that does just come up the most is like, again, we do have, so we, we put on a, an event called the, the 100 mile challenge. So we have, um, hundreds of people that sign up to kind of do this DIY challenge with us this summer where they'll either do a hundred mile hike in one shot, or they can sign up to kind of do it stacked. But um, a lot of them that are coming from kind of a keto background, they're, I think they're just searching for what they can take on trail that might be, you know, not too bulky, not too difficult to take on trail. So I guess in that sense, and from your, your background, you know, are there things that they could take on trail that are going to be high protein, high fat? Um, you know, you're kind of a lot of times I would imagine for you, like you're running a lot of aid station to aid station, but um, or else just running with no calories, which you've also done a lot of. Um, but is there, is, do you have any ideas of just quick hit list of, of things that, that could work for snacks or meals in a scenario like this where they're, you know, many of our people are trying to hike about 20 miles a day back to back to back for about five days. Yeah. So, I mean, from a meal standpoint, there's a lot of good dehydrated meals out there, like that are keto and low carb, <clears throat> um, don't utilize seed oils. Um, I forgot the name of them. I can look them up and send them to you later if you want, but okay. there are dehydrated meals you can utilize. But from a snacking perspective, like, you know, I've done a lot of like efforts where I'm out multiple hours on my own. Like there was an event that I did, not an event, but there was a trail. You're, you're in Utah, right? Yeah, we're in Cedar City down here in okay. Southern Utah, but I'll actually be heading up this weekend to hike in Cache Valley. 
should have just oh. coordinated and done this with you in person. Jeez. I didn't, I didn't yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm here this weekend too. You have to tell me where you're going. <laughs> We're, oh man. Brigham, our designer is from Cache Valley and he put together a route, but it's just, I'm just going up on top to a few lakes. It's a white pine lake. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. You're going to have snow. There's still snow up there. Yeah. He, he, he had us order some micro spikes and a few things. He's like, we <laughs> might still be going through. Dang. That's yeah. crazy. I think a week ago, there was still about 30 inches up there. <laughs> 30 inches? Oh, no. I mean, I'm sure it's down to maybe 15 or so now, but yeah, there's a good amount up there still. <laughs> That's um, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, I did the U- or sorry, the Uinta, high, or I forget what it's called. The It's like an 86-mile route to the Uintas. Um, part of the High Line? Yeah. Yeah. The, you the, went to Highline route. I did the whole route a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, there's no aid stations for that. So I had to carry all my right. food for that. <clears throat> and I'd say like the three things I utilized were, um, macadamia nuts just because they're pretty, um, light, they're like crazy and like, calorie per ounce, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're super <laughs> fat, fatty. <laughs> Um, yeah, so macadamia nuts and then beef sticks. Um, you know, like I buy a lot of those Epic, uh, like mm. venison bars and turkey bars or whatever. Um, and then the other thing, I, I don't know, I doubt you've heard of this, but have you heard of keto brick? No, no. <laughs> I mean, they're expensive, but I mean, they're essentially a mill replacement, but they're like these, like, they look like gold bricks. They're super thick. Um, oh, I would geez. Google it whenever you have time, but like, yeah. um, I'd say one brick probably weighs like a pound maybe, but like there's a thousand calories, there's 96 grams of fat, and then there's 36 grams of protein. And then I believe there's like 500 to a thousand milligrams of sodium. So you got your fats, wow. you got your calories, you got your electrolytes, and it only weighs about a pound. So I, I think those are awesome for mid race fueling. If you have to carry some calories, <laughs> I, I think the biggest question I have with those are, are they edible? <laughs> oh, they're so like, good. <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> my kid, he's six years old and like a lot of nights when he was ready for dessert, he'll ask for a keto brick. Like oh, I think they're really? pretty tasty. Yeah. They got peanut okay. butter. They got, um, they actually just came out. Do you know who, who Mark Bell is? The bodybuilder. Right. Yeah. 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 So he has his, um, shake steak, I believe is what it's called, which has like some liver spleen and heart, um, like powder in it. And so the keto brick just came out with like a, it's like a chocolate brownie keto brick, but also has some liver and pro it's basically used utilizing that shakes, shake steak shake that, that Mark has created. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to have to, I mean, I just pulled them up, so I'm going to have to do a little more digging and I'll let you know if it passed the taste test or not. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. No, that, that, that would be, I mean, that sounds super helpful, right? I mean, when you're, when you're out there on these efforts, um, yeah. Any other quick hits come to mind? Those, those three are awesome. Um, I mean, granola, like there's a, um, at, at natural grocers, there's a grain free granola that I'll utilize sometimes that has like a little bit of honey to sweeten it, but they got like, um, um, pumpkin seeds in it, cashews in it, and like a bunch of different nuts, um, bound together with a little bit of honey. And those are calorically dense, um, like protein bars. Like, I mean, I, I do a lot of like protein style type bars and, and jerky and nuts basically, um, yeah. or mostly what I utilize. So, all right. I, I got to take this in a, in a different direction here for just a second. So the guy that took second at Cocodona, um, Josh Perry, uh-huh. Right. So yeah. I've had him on the podcast. He, after he set the FKT on the Pacific crush trail, I brought him on, talked to him and he, he blew my mind. Right. Cause he's, he's walking like 20 hours a day typically. And then, um, but his diet blew my mind. He, he was eating about 12,000 calories a day during what? This, this PCT. Yes. Yeah. And it's like 3000. This is how he breaks it up. Okay. There's about 3000 calories of like nuts and, and stuff like that, um, which I like totally expected. And he's like, I ate about 3000 calories of like any kind of bars. Just think like cereal bars, granola bars, any kind of bars. Right. And uh-huh. then he eats 
3,000 calories of gummies, any kind of gummies, fruit snacks, gummy bears. Yes. What? Yes. Holy and cow. then to top it off, 3,000 calories of various assortments of M&Ms. What? That is, that is, that's his diet. And, and I mean, he crushed the, the FKT for the Pacific Crest Trail on that diet. Okay. So he's getting 6,000 calories from gummies and M&Ms. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is- My jaw like hit the table when, when I was talking to him about this. I was like, like I was thinking like, you know, cause I, I, I think I'm like a bit of a strategic thinker and I just, I'm thinking like, he's got nutrition dialed and all this. And he's just like, nope. He's like, I get enough protein in to like help with muscles and stuff. And then like from there, it's just calories. Like that's all he cares about is just calories. And, uh, but just, it was insane. And so I actually read a post on his Instagram after the Coca Dona and it just kind of was like, yeah, I had a little bit of stomach issue, but then kind of my, my through hiking gut and legs like set in and I was good to go. Like he just went back to like, so I'm sure when he was racing you, like that's what he's doing. Right. Yeah. Um, holy cow. So he doesn't do so, any real food. I mean, like if he's going through a town or something, yeah, like he has to stop. He has to charge stuff because he has to, he has to track it. Right. And he's doing an unsupported, um, not a supported model. So like he's getting food when he is stopping at, at places, but, um, no, he's not stopping at all for meals. Like he's wow. hiking nonstop, never stopping. I mean, and, and that's, that also blew me away too. Cause I'm like, so how much are you like jogging and running? He's like, I don't run anything. Like I don't, <laughs> any, I didn't zero running. And I'm like, what the heck? But then it kind of made sense. Cause he's doing this, you know, tortoise to their hair approach where it's like, he just never stops. The only thing he tracks is like break time. So like he'll like time, how much time it takes him to go to the bathroom. Cause you know wow. what I mean? Cause like that, because otherwise he'd be tracking like 20 hours a day of like movement time versus like 20 minutes a day of like stop time. Like he just doesn't stop. That's wild. He did tell me that when I passed him that like when I passed him at Cocodona and he started running with me a little bit, he's like, this is the first time I've ran this whole race. I was like, wow, (laughs) you're way up here. That's, that's true. (laughs) Yeah. He's cool. I like him. (laughs) He's a, he's a funny guy, man. I like him too. Um, so what would be the benefits, right? So like you've got polarizing diets here. You've got Josh Perry diet and you've got Michael McKnight diet here. Why do one or the other? I mean, you just got to do what works for your body. Like, you know, I, I don't believe there's one style of nutrition that's right for everybody. Um, I mean, I have said multiple times though, that like, if I ever get to a point where I stop performing well at these races. And I wonder if it's like nutrition related, I'm going to have a really hard time deciding what to do because like, just from a health standpoint, I feel so good eating this way. Um, I've never felt better. I've never felt healthier. And so like, you know, I'd have a hard time shifting my diet to run better. Um, I'm guessing that's never going to happen, but (laughs) I mean, yeah, I just feel so good eating this way, but yeah, I mean, from a racing standpoint, like, you know, there's vegans that are thriving in the ultra running world. Um, I don't know if you knew, do you know who Andrew Glaze is? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, you know about his like hundred mile running streaks? No, no. So Andrew Glaze, he's a runner based out of California and he follows a vegan diet and like, he's been running a hundred plus mile weeks for I want to say like 180 weeks, like he's approaching 200 weeks. Yeah. Um, he races a ton. Like he did, he did a hundred K. So Cocodona starts on a Monday, three days before on a Friday, he did a race in California. That was a hundred K. He finished Sunday morning, drove wow. to Cocodona and then he ran Cocodona. <laughs> and oh so like, he's just like, putting in these huge miles like all the time and he's following a vegan diet. And one of the biggest like criticisms of of a vegan diet is just that like, you're not getting in enough like bioavailable protein, um, that your body's just going to break down because you're not getting enough nutrients from a vegan diet, but he's out there proving everybody wrong. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. it takes a lot to run that many miles a week that consistently for that long. So you know, I, yeah. I firmly just believe that like everybody's body thrives differently. And, 
Josh thrives off of gummies and <laughs> M&Ms <laughs> and I thrive off of raw milk. Like right. there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> both both are just as surprising. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine drinking milk and then just running, you know, like, oh. I'm pretty sure yeah. that's like, like challenge material for Instagram and TikTok. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's super interesting. As long as you can trust this guy, right? After the liver king, I don't know what you can trust anymore. Oh so. gosh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but but that does bring up a really cool point, though, about what you're doing is and doing some of this research. I didn't realize this, but someone that I'm I've been very enamored with recently has been Jeff Browning. Hmm. Uh, right, yeah. and and he follows your your diet as well, or close to it, or his variation of it. Right. I would say I follow his diet. He's the one that got okay. me onto it. <laughs> yeah, like. I, I listened to a podcast around Hard Rock 100 timeframe last year. And again, I've, I ran my first ultra last year, kind of got interested in any of this not very long ago, right? So like I'm, I'm really new. Um, anyways, so I was listening to this and, and it just, it's, it's mind blowing the longevity he has. And, and for mm. me, that's a huge priority f- for myself is I, I decided in my early 20s, like all the things that I love doing are heavily related to my health, my ability to stay healthy and be able to do them, right? Like whether it's hiking, whether it's running, whether it's riding bikes or dirt bikes, or if, you know, just fill in the the blank, like everything I love to do or hunting, you know, like it's, it's so related to my physical ability to do those. And so this long, this concept of longevity is, is really interesting. And obviously he's out there crushing hundred milers at 50 something years old, which is insane. And one of the things he talks about a lot is, like his, his recovery period from, from doing this kind of a diet. So I'd love to hear what your experience is recovering after some of these and, and how that's changed with, with this type of an approach. Oh yeah. It's a night and day difference. Like, I mean, the, the example I always give people when it comes to this is, um, you know, in 2017 and 2019, I did what's called the triple crown of two hundreds. Uh, for those listening who don't know what that is, basically there's the Bigfoot 200 in August, the Tahoe 200 in September, and then the Moab 240 in October. And the Triple Crown is doing those three 200s in the same calendar year. So <laughs> you're essentially doing three 200s in the span of 60 days. And in 2017, my first time doing it, um, that's actually four months before I started the Triple Crown is when I started my um, low carb journey or whatever you want to call it. Um, Mm -hmm. but I, um, I, I had to hang kind of this carrot in front of me for those three races that year where like I reached a certain point in all three races where I was just like ready to quit. But then I, and I know a lot of people will think this is not healthy, (laughs) um, to have to do this, but I essentially had to like bribe myself. Like if I finish this race, then I can spend the next three days eating like junk. (laughs) And so (laughs) I use that. I got that. I use that as motivation to get to the finish. And then I'd spend three days. Like I need to, I I, I need to find the picture and send it to you. But I remember after my first 200, I went and I got like, I went to five different fast food chains to pick up like different little pieces of food that I liked. Like I went to KFC and I got a bucket of fried chicken. I went to A and W and got like a basket of deep fried cheese curds. Um, I went somewhere else, I think maybe red Robin to get some onion rings. Like, like it was a big, like deep fried meal that I had. (laughs) And like, I did that after all those races, but between those races, like I, I I couldn't run once because I was so inflamed. My legs just Mm. swelled up and ballooned up. My joints hurt. Like I was basically just trying to survive between those races. And then like a few days before the race, I was just like, holy cow, I hope my body figures out how to just get through this because I don't know how I'm going to do another 200 miles. And I had IT band issues in all the races. I developed a stress fracture at the Moab 240. Like it was a train wreck, but I, I still finished all three races. I somehow still got the overall like combined triple crown of 200s record that year. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> but um you know, after that, I was like, okay, like all these things went wrong. I'm going to come back in 2019 and try and do, try and do better. And in those two years, like I did a lot more studying of my approach, my nutritional approach. And I realized that like, I did it completely backwards because from what I read after the races, those are the times that you want to be the strictest with your food choices. 
Um, because obviously like the breading, the seed oils, like all that stuff is what caused my body to balloon up and slow down recovery. Um, so in 2019, I essentially did like a carnivore diet the first three days, three or four days after those two hundreds. And like, you know, within five days I was running again. I had no swelling. I had no inflammation. I had no issues. I ended up winning all three of those 200s that year and set some kind of course record on each course that year. And then I ended up beating my triple crown of 200s time by, it was like 44 or 45 hours. Um, Holy cow. Like it was a monumental <clears throat> difference. And the yeah. biggest thing that I did differently was like, I was very clean with my nutrition between those races. And so that was kind of like a really eye opening moment for me. And that's, I would say, was the pivoting point for me where like I stopped, like, like I do believe in the 80, 20 rule. Like I, I coach people with this nutritional approach and I'm just like, Hey, you know, if you need to allow yourself 20% flexibility each week to have a little bit of stuff, that's not the best, then do that. Um, but for me, I don't do that anymore just because I like just saw how better I recovered the stricter I was. So, you know, for me, I now just view food as like, not something to be enjoyed, even though I do love eating this way. <laughs> like for me, it's just like, I look at it as just part of my training. Like, you know, I want to eat this way. So I recover faster to get ready for my next race. But yeah, that's the biggest uh, benefit I've seen with this approach is just like how much, um, how low the inflammation is and then how much quicker you recover after a big effort. Does, does that inflammation also helps? Like I'd imagine that it, that it also <clears throat> helps inflammation stay low during the efforts, right? So like a lot of our listeners that are going out, if they're doing a five or a seven day effort, a lot of times what you'll see is they start to develop an issue day two, day three, day four, you know, and, and, and then it just kind of, they have to deal with that there in past. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of guilty of that too. I, I did a 20 mile run on Friday and I felt pretty ginger, like my knees felt a little swollen and ginger, uh, kind of over the weekend. And, you know, I, so I guess, I guess my curiosity is like, does this also help in the moment from, from developing injuries in the field on these massive efforts? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. At least in my experience, um, <clears throat> I remember there was a big effort I was doing and I was just really craving some chicken wings. <laughs> um, and so I had my wife go pick some up. And typically I get chicken wings from uh, Buffalo wild wings because they actually deep fry their, um, their wings in beef shortening instead of seed oil. And so, but in this effort, she just went to some random store and got me some, and I didn't even think about how they were probably deep fried in seed oils. Um, and this was a multi-day thing. I had it at like 11 PM at night. And then I went to bed and I woke up the next day and my legs ballooned up. And that was the first time they ballooned up in a long time. And I was just yeah. like, Oh, like it's the seed oils. Like you idiot, Mike. <laughs> um, and so like for, from now, like that's why when I go to a race, I have my crew bring butter to the aid station and have them do it. <clears throat> um, I even bring like uh, do you know the brand Siete? Mm -hmm. Um, Siete. Siete. Yeah. They, they mostly are known for like creating Hispanic foods. Um, but one of their child children are, has a, a celiac, I believe. And so yeah. all their products don't have gluten in it and gluten's inflammatory. Um, they have tortilla shells that are based, um, with almond flour. And so like a lot of these races, I'll bring my own Siete almond flour tortillas and just, you know, I'll be like, Hey guys, I would like a quesadilla at the next aid station. So go ask the, the volunteers to make it for me, but give them my tortillas. Um, and so yeah. I do bring like a lot of my own stuff so I can, you know, avoid those potential ingredients that would contribute a little bit of inflammation during the actual event. Yeah. I, I notice it a lot with carbohydrates, just mm -hmm. instant inflammation and like bloat. So if I was to say, eat a pizza, um, I get so thirsty afterward mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm like, I'm a 200 pounder, right? I'm a big dude. So like I can see myself if like, if I have a weekend of bad eating and I know there's a lot of carbs in there, I can actually see the scale. I mean, I can jump. It's not been off the, I mean, it, it has happened before where I've gained a full 10 pounds in mm -hmm. like going from like before I went for a run on this day and then like had a bad weekend or maybe a three day weekend 
get back on the scale and I'll be 10 pounds heavier. And I've, I've noticed too, that I think potentially, um, I'm going to lose it. Uh, <laughs> the glu- uh, no. glu- gluten, no gluten, um, that like, I think that may be related to my swelling. Um, part, part of like where I also will, like specifically not just water retention, but actually some, some additional swelling from, from the gluten itself. But, um, I feel like, I feel like that might be a little bit more common than, but I don't know. I've, I've never tried not doing seed oils or anything <laughs> like that. That's, that's a whole nother realm of, of, uh, <sighs> watching things. Well, if you want to watch for that, you're going to have to go down. And, yeah, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> you're, you're never going to eat out again. Everybody uses no. seed oils. It's crazy. Yeah. No, and ha- and basically, basically everything at the store has seed oil in it. You know. Like yep. It's, yeah, it's that's a, why I eat the same thing every day. That's why I don't eat out anymore. And if I do eat out, I do a lot of research to make sure they don't use seed oils or to make sure that they take requests. Like when I go to mm-hmm. Texas Roadhouse or something, I'm like, hey. I might be telling a little bit of a white lie, but I'm just like, Hey, I have a seed oil allergy. So please just cook my steak either in butter or just flat on the grill with no oils added to it. Um, so it does take a little bit of commitment. Um, but yeah, gluten, most people have an inflammatory response to it. I mean, scientifically carbohydrates, water holds on to carbohydrates. And so when you do have like a bad weekend of eating a lot of carbohydrates, like that 10 pounds that you gained, like I guess nine pounds of it is just water weight. Yeah, <laughs> um, it'll come back off if I eat better for a few days and, and exercise. Yeah. And I'm guessing that your stomach does feel like a lot more jiggly. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what happens to me too. Like whenever I have a higher carbohydrate week, um, like I used to do sushi every Friday night before a long run. Um, but now like I legit just do meat, eggs, raw dairy and fruit, like, and that's it. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, like when I would do sushi, I would gain five to 10 pounds and most of it was water weight and my stomach like had a lot more (laughs) jiggle to it. Like (laughs) like, you're speaking my language. That's exactly what I ate after that 20 mile run. I literally went to a Chinese buffet (laughs) and ate sushi. (laughs) It's so good. The like simple (laughs) carbohydrate with the rice and the protein, like sushi is so good. (laughs) But, um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, So there was a, me and a buddy, we just started a podcast where we talk about food, basically, like we're calling it the primal show. And we, we teamed up with a company called levels health and they sent us a continuous glucose monitor. And we were going to do this thing where like the monitor was going to work for a month. We were going to do the first two weeks eating our own typical diet just to see, you know, what the, the data showed. And like I said, at the start of this podcast, like I would eat a big bowl of fruit with honey. My blood glucose was like 80 before I ate it. And the highest that went up to is like 90, which like for anybody that knows anything about blood glucose levels, they say the normal range, I believe is like 70 or 80 to 150. And so it's a wide range, but like I was still on the low end of that range, even after eating like 60 grams of carbohydrates in the form of fruit. But, um, Towards the end of this experiment, we were going to try doing the standard American diet for a whole week um, just to see what would happen with the glucose and like, you know, how long it would take to potentially periodically just rise. Um, And so long story short, we only lasted a day. We did not last a full week. Um, But like, so, and the thing was, is we told everybody we're just going to eat how we used to eat. And for me, um, I'm sure you've heard of Panda Express. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So before I ate this way, like Panda Express, I probably ate there like no joke three to four times a week. Like <laughs> I was a dick. Like I'm when everybody asked me the foods I miss, they're like, Do you miss ice cream? Do you miss cake and stuff? I'm like, no, I don't miss any of that, but I miss deep fried Chinese food. Like I love that stuff. <laughs> it's <laughs> but so like good. it's so good. So like my first meal was Panda Express. Um, I had it on a Friday night. Interestingly enough, my glucose only spiked to about 110. And so for me, like that confirmed that like if you're metabolically healthy, like one bad meal a week is not going to jeopardize your health if you're okay with all the other negatives that come from it, which I was not okay with. And what I mean by that was I didn't sleep good that night. I woke up with the biggest headache of my life. And then that run, that day, that run, it was my long run. Um, I'd done that route multiple times and like I ran it, no joke, two minutes per mile slower just because my joints ached. 
I just felt super fatigued and dead. I had that stupid headache I couldn't get rid of. Um, mm. Not to give too much information, but like I had diarrhea like crazy. <laughs> and like those negatives <laughs> just... lasted for three days. Like wow. I had a headache for three days. I had <laughs> diarrhea for three days. My energy on my runs were junk. And so I'm sure a lot of that's just because of how strict I am. But, you know, for me, like that's not worth it. Like I'd much rather just be strict and feel good and feel fresh and feel healthy. <laughs> well, you, you can adapt to diets at an extreme level, right? I always remember, um, I lived a couple of years in Malaysia and you'd, you'd actually bring something that was finally sweet and good to taste. And like the people there would try to eat it and they would just it take like two bites and be like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be sick. Like I can't, I can't even touch it. Right. And I mean, they just knew so quickly that they couldn't, and I'm over here like, dude, just keep it coming. Like I haven't had sugar in so long, you know? And, um, so I think, I think in so many ways, like the body, you know, it, it does adapt and it does just, just totally. Anyways, I know, I know one thing I wanted to talk about was your broken or broken to breaking, uh, documentary. Hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's a documentary about you breaking the Colorado trail FKT, which is, which is awesome. We're going to go do a hundred miles of that trail this summer as a, as a team here at Dr. Vital. So I'm excited to go. We're going to go kind of through the San Juan, start on the, the San Juan side with, with, oh, uh, nice. out of uh, Durango there. So looking forward to that. But I, I do remember you like ate a donut in that, right? And you got <laughs> so mad <laughs> about eating that donut. Cause you're like, it's, make, it's making my knees hurt or, you know, like it was pretty like pretty immediate how fast you can pick up on things, which I think there's so many people walking around that are in pain all the time, but they're in so much pain. They can't pick up on it. Like someone mm-hmm. like you could. Yeah. You're just right. chronically used to it. And it's just how you live your life. And once you cut that stuff out and see how good you can feel you to, yeah, you notice it pretty quickly. And I'm like, yeah. you know, everybody jokes with me and I agree. It's like, it's like you probably had issues after that donut, like not because of the donut, but because you were 400 miles into this thing. And yeah. like, I do agree with them to an extent, but it's like, so like what happened was like, my knee was like, just kind of in this gray area from mile 300 to 400, where it was like kind of sore, kind of tender. It didn't feel right. I had to do like a lot of mobility work to keep it feeling okay. And then I went and I had that donut and then I left. And then like five miles later, like it just like went to crap. And it, it so tipped you over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, I do believe the initial issues stemmed from just high mileage, but I also believe that that the high sugar content of that donut, which I hardly ever have. And then the gluten in that donut, which I never have just like was enough to just like send it over to the other side. So yeah, high mileage does wear the body down, but nutrition. Yeah. Fashion, yeah. I mean, that, that documentary was awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. It was, um, how, how fast did you end up completing the, the Colorado trail? Um, it was seven days and 13 hours. Yeah just a, a phenomenal effort for sure. And, and then that country is, it's no joke, right? Like I've like the San Juans, even that that's kind of the section I've been in more and they're, they're just insane. Like you can get to a trailhead and already like I, I did this last year. I pulled up to a trailhead late at night and I was feeling like minor altitude sickness before I got out of the vehicle. You know what I mean? Cause I was, I would like, I don't even know what I was. I was like, above 11,000 feet or, or close to 12,000 feet at the trailhead. You know, I mean, it's just nuts <laughs> how high those mountains are and just how brutal they are. But, um, I, I need to let you go. I need to wrap this up. Um, quick question. How many eggs a week do you eat? <laughs> uh, <laughs> just me about four dozen a week, <laughs> four dozen eggs. It's yeah. crazy. Do you do the I mean, rocky you- thing and just eat them raw? Just drink them? Um, I mean like this morning with my, how quickly I had to get out to that run club thing, like that protein shake that I made, I did add two raw eggs to it. But I mean, when we're done here, I have a few coaching calls, but for lunch, I'm probably going to scramble up six or seven eggs. So I have a yeah. good eight, eight or so eggs a day, probably. <laughs> oh That's crazy. <laughs> well, They're so I, cheap I, and delicious, like it's hard I, to beat them. Right. And going back to that topic of, of, uh, longevity, I was listening to something uh, a month or so back or a couple months back and about them doing a big study about like 
uh, centennials, people that have lived past 100 years, and the only thing that they could find in their diets that was like consistent to to help them. Like, you know, they're hoping probably to find like, oh, they ate this every day and that helped them live this long. But the only thing that they found was that they ate basically the same diet every single day. Really? Yeah. I thought that was really interesting and, and it probably bodes really well for what you and, and Jeff are doing and, and just kind of eating that consistency. You dial it in for your body and uh, who knows, maybe you're going to be like 150 <laughs> years old, still running these ultras. So <laughs> I want to be opposed to that. I mean, <laughs> right. like it eliminates decision fatigue too, right? It's like, oh, I'll go to the grocery store and buy four dozen eggs, uh, six pounds of ground beef, some butter. And like, you know, yeah. this is what I'm having every day. <laughs> Done deal. Done deal. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, again, I recommend everyone go watch that documentary as well as um, just follow you on Instagram at the Low Carb Runner. Uh, you do coaching calls as well. So if anyone listening to this is, is probably more on the running side of things than anything, maybe maybe just do diet call, like dietitian type calls, but um, anywhere else that people should reach out and find you. Um, yeah, Instagram is the best. And then I have a contact form on my website, which is lowcarb-runner.com. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. This was super enlightening. I know I got a lot out of this and I wish I had a little bit more time because I'm, I'm interested even from a selfish perspective of I've got, I'm going to run the Tusher mountain race, uh, at the end of July. Nice. And I'm like, man, should I even start to attempt any of this stuff? Or is it just don't mess with it at this point? I don't know. I mean, just, I guess <laughs> yes or no on that. <laughs> I mean, if you're not low carb, that's kind of a quick time to try to adapt. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I won't, I won't mess with it at this point, but anyways, thanks again, Michael. Uh, it was awesome to have you and, and just a wealth of information. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And let me know if you have time to chat when you're up here this weekend. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks so much for joining us for that interview again. Thanks Michael for the time. It was I, I wish I had so much more time. I, I, there's so much more I want to ask. And uh, maybe I'm going to have to sign up for this coaching and just continue to learn on this subject. But uh, a phenomenal wealth of information. And I hope you guys took something away from this for sure. Just wanted to make mention of a couple things really quick before you go. Uh, we did recently release our new Skyline Trail shorts. If you guys want to go check those out, I can definitely help you as you start upping miles for summer outings and adventures. And if you have not yet, please rate and leave us a review on the podcast. Make sure you guys are subscribed. Uh, we'll continue to have some phenomenal guests and stories to tell coming up. Uh, I will take some time in some future episodes to walk through even my strategy for the Tusher Ultra Race and just how I'm thinking about fueling and, and kind of the things there, as well as our upcoming 100-mile challenge hike uh, which we're, we're looking forward to as well. And for us, that's going to be in July. So got some great content coming up. I hope you guys are getting out there, hitting the trail, getting some good miles in. And I hope that this conversation helped you if you were struggling with diet or how to maybe keep carbs down on the trail. Okay. Thanks guys. And we'll see you guys in a future episode.